Hello and welcome to the Indiana State Police Roadshow. I'm your host, Sergeant John Perrine, Public Information Officer for the Indiana State Police Indianapolis District. The Roadshow is brought to you by the Indiana State Police Alliance and Cops for Kids, a subsidiary of the State Police Alliance. For more information about our sponsor, visit www.indianasfinest.com. We want to thank Network Indiana and uh, for let, but getting us on the radio each and every week across the state of Indiana. Uh, Eddie's out today. We got our good friend Sam Fritz in there uh, pushing the buttons and uh, getting us on the radio. And of course, Tom Trials here putting us on YouTube, making us look way better on on TV than we do in person, especially when it comes to my guests today. I need all the help I can get. And that's a familiar voice, a familiar face for those of you watched on YouTube. That's my good buddy Mike Pruitt. Mike's back. I am. Yeah, after he stood me up for the it, last few it tapings. It's been a busy summer. Yeah, um, you know, I can't imagine because you are a person that just has your hand in everything. Yeah, I'm not sure it's always a good thing, but... Uh, does your wife even recognize you when you come home? She's like, who are you? She does, because <laughs> she always has a uh, list of things that I probably need to be doing when I walk in the door, so there's no doubt that she knows who I am when I come in the door, but... Uh, no. So, so Mike Pruitt, Deputy Chief Barkers for the Fire Department, also the uh, coroner for Johnson County, also a member of Task Force One, Indiana Task Force One. And that's what we're going to talk about today is... Uh, uh, that that kind of unusual deployment, and I say unusual because you guys actually had to hop on a plane, but you guys went to uh, Hawaii to help uh, out there. We did. Um, you know, uh, one thing we've noticed, and, and I've been with the task force for just under a little twenty under twenty years, and one of the things that I've noticed in the last five years or so is we are responding to unique calls uh, that we normally would not be called to respond to. Um, and in this case, large fire, wildfire that swept through a community there. And we had the capabilities to come in there along with other uh, FEMA USAR teams and help that community searching for basically what it came down to is searching for people that were unaccounted for through about nine square miles of, of basically devastation of nothing but ash and burnt buildings. And and that was something that uh, we had not done as a team. Uh, you know, we've responding to hurricanes and building collapses, but this was our first experience as a team in dealing with a, a scenario like this. Um, but yeah, it was a trip off of what we call uh, Oconus, which is outside the continental U.S. to the state of Hawaii in Maui, and spent just under 10 days working in the town of Lahaina, um, where it just literally wiped that that town off the face of the map. Have you ever seen anything like it? I mean, you've been to a lot of wildfires, but those are usually in rural areas. And yeah, um, you know, I've been to wildfires, but uh, I haven't been to where there's been that much devastation to a community. Um, you get a few structures that may have uh, caught fire and burnt to the ground, but the loss of life, uh, those that are still unaccounted for there. Um, and that that side of that destruction that happened in that area, I mean, you could literally go one mile either direction in that from that community, and you would never have known there was a fire. Um, so that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that up close and personal, and also talked to the firefighters, the police officers that were there when the fire uh, spread through that community. And just to hear their stories, uh, it was just an amazing uh, just just there trying to survive that, uh, listening to their stories was just an amazing feat. And unfortunately, so many people did not survive that fire. Yeah, and you know, you always give safety tips about fire and, and having a plan and all that. But, um, you know, in your experience, the uniqueness of this one with the high winds, and, and you tell me as hot as that fire was, there was nowhere to go for some of these there, people. There wasn't. Um, you know, in, in talking to uh, locals that we had the opportunity to talk to, the fire department, it's not uncommon for them to deal with these types of fires uh, in that area of Maui. Um, there's a lot of dry area. They were they're going through an El Nino out there, and so they'd been in drought conditions. But it had not been something abnormal for them to respond to a fire, especially whether it was a power line that had fallen down from the wind, started a fire, they brought it under control. Um, you know, they had their system down for taking care of that. You had Mother Nature hurricane to the south of the hawaiian islands into that along with the dry conditions along with the fire and now you've uh you've brought a whole new event to them and placed it at their doorstep that they had to respond to um and they did and there was just a lot of factors that allowed this fire to uh to spread like it did 
and the winds were the big thing. I, and just talking to some of the, I mean, they were estimating that some of, some of this fire spread a mile a minute. Wow. You're not going to outrun that. Um, and there was estimations that the temperatures got up to be over 25, around 2,500 degrees. We saw it, we saw a fire truck that Maui Fire had responded. They were basically making an attempt to protect a long-term care facility. There were two fire engines there. This crew, there was eight firefighters there on the scene altogether. They literally escaped with the with their lives in a police cruiser. They piled eight people in this police cruiser. It was the only thing they could fit down because the streets were blocked now with cars and tree that had fallen. They barely escaped with their lives in this police cruiser, all eight of them packed inside this vehicle. Wow. But the aluminum wheels, the most interesting is there was really nothing left of the fire engine that was still there. The aluminum wheels ran down the street like candle wax. It just literally melted everything down. So it was just, we did. We just saw so many unique things like that uh, that occurred. You know, a lot of times we'll go on a, a building fire or even a house fire, and there are personal items still left. There was nothing, unless it was metal, uh, like forks, knives, things like that. There wasn't anything left. Well, and, and even more difficult is is the remains of the folks that are deceased. Essentially, at that temperature, it's like being cremated. I mean, it's it, it is. It is. Um, you know, when we look at cremation in, in around fifteen hundred degrees, um, you know, there was just nothing left. And and a lot of the teams that came in and searched were able to find some remains. Um, we utilize our human remains dogs to come in and help search. And, and we, when we would get an indication that maybe there were remains present, um, we went through a very meticulous process of sifting through those ashes, putting them in buckets, spreading them out on the street. And then the archaeologists would be down on their hands and knees, basically going through all of this ash, uh, looking for human remains. So um, it was a lot of hard work. Uh, in the environment that we were working in. Um, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this community rebuilds because a lot of times, you know, we go to a hurricane response, it'll wipe out portions of the community. They come in, they clean it up, but we're talking about everything gone. Stores, all the businesses there. So it's going to be a long, long, long road to recovery for those for those yeah. individuals, I mean, the infrastructure is gone, right? The power lines, the power it poles. Is. I mean, there's nothing, right? There's and nothing. Just, just devastating. And so, talk about though, because Task Force One, I think, is a te- there's a testament to the skill that, that you folks have is is the way you were utilized. Um, but most of the time, you get the call, your trucks are packed, your your gear is packed, and you guys convoy wherever you're going. Uh, how difficult was it trying to get what you need, not really knowing what you need, on an airplane to Hawaii? So it's uh, we have a, a way to consolidate our equipment package and our logistics personnel. Uh, they know what that list is based on the type of incident we're going to. And obviously, we can't predict everything we're going to be faced with, but we kind of know from the intelligence on the ground what we're going to need. They condense that package down. It goes through a whole check-in process with getting it packaged for flight. Uh, which is a whole separate operation in itself. And then, uh, as in the case when we went to Hawaii, the personnel went on one aircraft and our equipment came the next day uh, as it was moved there. So every team had to go through that. It's a huge logistics move. Uh, We had not seen that since we went to Puerto Rico a few years ago when we responded down there to Hurricane Maria. Mm -hmm. Um, But fortunately, we did get our equipment there. And then, you know, once we get there, um, one of the most impressive things about this was we got to Maui. Eventually, when we got settled in, we were able to start ordering equipment. Now, being on an island, you just can't drive trucks with equipment from other places there to bring equipment in. So the locals, the private public partnerships there in Maui to get us the equipment we needed, whether it was heavy equipment, mm-hmm. um, supplies, anything like that, actually worked very smooth it may have taken a little bit longer but it actually worked very smooth so there was a lot of great cooperation there uh in that community to help us get the things we need to help the locals and one thing that's unique about your team is the different roles that everybody plays and most of the people on your team come from firefighter background or or public safety background um but we think of task force one responding to these things in a search and rescue mission and that's kind of what you were in 
but you also had engineers helping sure up buildings before those buildings could be searched, right? So that's some of the stuff I saw on social media that you guys were doing out there. Yeah, we have we have such a talented group of individuals that come from various backgrounds, and like backgrounds, and like you said, some are law enforcement, some are uh, fire department, EMS, but we also bring our own structural engineers with us, and these guys. Their job is to get there, look at the building and go, okay, we need to do some work to shore this thing up before we allow you to go in there and work. And and th- that was the case. And when we went to Lahaina, we had an apartment building that had an area that had been exposed to extreme heat in, in some of the support systems. And we shored this thing up structurally. So we had to order the lumber in, uh, make sure we had the right tools to make all the cuts. And our, and our structural specialist, along with our rescue uh, personnel, they're trained in this. This is what they practice on mm-hmm. building shoring. They do the calculations. They're really nerdy about the math. Yeah. Um, our structural engineers were looking at this, and it, they were in their element, you know, determining just how much shoring we were going to have to build to hold the building up to make it safe enough for our personnel to go on the floor. And we did that, and we accomplished that. And that's something that a lot of the USAR teams have not done, even though that's been the main focus of our training for years is structural uh, shoring. And so this was like the first time in a while we'd actually done this. Uh, so other teams came to see our work, and we were pretty proud of that uh, and being able to do that. Yeah, and so you guys spend about 10 days over there. Uh, you land in Indianapolis to the news of, of a major hurricane getting ready to hit Florida, and you, you guys kind of get the call and say, we, we can't, unfortunately. Yeah, most of our equipment, a lot of our equipment was still in Hawaii. Yeah. So we were not in service. I mean, we could have provided some smaller elements, boat rescue, uh, but – you know, we we sat that one out. We did send a few people down that were a part of the incident support team uh, that many of our members are a member of. Um, but yeah, we sat this one out. So you know, that's how it goes sometimes. That's okay because uh, usually you guys are deployed within twenty four hours, right? You get the call and you're you're gone twenty four hours later. Yeah, I mean, it, we have to be on the road pretty quick once we receive that call. And when you're moving a machine as big as we are, when you're taking seventy to eighty people out the door, uh, and our members come from all around the state of Indiana. So we have so many hours to get there, get ourselves packed, checked in. And so it's quite the process for us to get out the door. But uh, we've gotten pretty good at this over the past few years because we've been deployed. I can remember a time early on when I came on the team, we would be deployed and we would find ourselves sitting because all emergencies start local and they end local. So if you get the local community that decides they don't need FEMA rescue resources, we, you know, they pre-stage us. Uh, then we may not do anything. But I can tell you that has really changed in the past few years where um, the states or the local agencies are like, yeah, let's get the FEMA USAR teams in here to work alongside with our people so that we can we can get this job done quicker and more efficiently. Well, when you're talking about rescuing, uh, time is of the essence there. And, it is. And they can't wait you know, 15 or 20 hours for you guys to drive down there Absolutely. Uh, if somebody's stranded. And, and so, so I, they pre-stage us a lot now. Uh, nearby, trying and, to keep us out of the eye of the And storm. there's a lot of value in that, right? I mean, you I know you've rode through a couple of hurricanes now, um, but just the way that you can immediately respond in the, I mean, we're talking almost minutes after this thing's over, you guys are out rescuing. We are. And one of the other big things we bring to the game is we used to like data collection. We used to do it manually. You had to write everything down. You know, I found a collapsed house. And then at the end of the day, you would input all that information. Now with technology we have, we're live. So as we have individuals walking around with uh, iPads, as we search areas, they're entering live information that can be seen at the command post. It can be seen at the local EFC and all the way back to D.C. So it's really valuable uh, training and, and equipment and capability that our use our teams offer. Yeah, really cool. We've been we talking with Deputy Chief Mike Pruitt. Uh, many of you know, longtime friend of mine, and uh, certainly uh, respect all the hats that he wears. I mean, every time there's an emergency somewhere in the country, I'm usually texting with him, hey, are you going? And most of the time the answer is yes. And uh, the epitome of public service. I mean, <laughs> seriously, you, you do it all. And How come you don't talk nice to me like this when we're off well, air? No. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have any jokes at the time. I'm just kidding. But um, but we've been talking about that. Indiana Task Force One and, and uh, uh, an amazing group of people that in a moment's notice uh, respond to these emergencies, respond anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world almost, uh, when they're needed. And and uh, certainly appreciate you and, and them. Uh, we want to thank everybody for tuning in to the Indiana State Police Roadshow brought to you by the Indiana State Police Alliance and Cops for Kids. Uh, We want to thank MS Communication Network Indiana for getting us on the radio across the state of Indiana. Uh, Tom Trial for getting us on YouTube. Thank you very much for that. 
And my guest again, the Deputy Chief Mike Pruitt, the man who wears many hats, including uh, 4-H connoisseur. <laughs> I couldn't do it without your support, yeah. John. So, so thank you very much. Everybody have be safe and buckle up. Thank you.